Thank you very much for being here. This is number three in our webinar series. This is an open dialogue week. And one of the questions that people ask most often and the things they wanted to know when we asked what do you want to know was we want people to have a better understanding of how QC works, how QC rules work. And I thought that was a good hot topic to, to look at today. I'd like to remind you what we're doing with this webinar series. You may think it's a little scattered, you may think it's a little disorganized. It is on a very specific path, believe it or not, to convince you that the QC we are doing today has flaws and we really should look at that and do something about it. I do have a solution, but there's no point me showing you a better way until people are convinced that we really do need to change. I'm hoping that by the end of this, you're going to be as frustrated and as, as enthusiastic as I am about making some change in how we do quality control. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is David. And the topic today is something about how these rules work. And actually, it's an interesting question because in a sense they work very well, and then on another hand, they don't work as well as we'd like. And this is all due to the Gaussian curve that you've heard about when you were in school and you got a lousy grade, which I know I did. You probably never experienced that. And you would ask if the teacher was going to grade on the curve. Well, it's that, that curve that we're talking about. Now, I won't go into the question about the 1-2-S warning, except to say again, that when Westgard invented these rules, or really brought them together in one place, he put in the 1-2-S as a warning. It was never, ever proposed as a reject signal. And in 1974, when the CAP first proposed rules, there were computers in the laboratory. There weren't lots of laptops like most of us have today. In 1981, when Jim Westgard and his group published the rules, they didn't have computers. They had a DuPont ACA analyzer in their lab. Didn't have a computer with it. So you couldn't really do justice to the rules that he came up with, particularly the 10 mean rule. So they had to put in something that would stop them from having to count back as many as nine runs. It's more than a week's worth of data to see if they broke a rule. So they put the warning in to reduce that problem. We don't discuss that anymore, <laughs> which I just did, as a warning because the computer takes care of it. So really what we do today here's my first slide, is we'll begin with the 1-3-S. And I don't know, Zoe, you want to try this? The 1-3-S happens to be violated on run 7. You can see it all the way over there. You see level X is outside 3-S. Everything before that was okay. Now, this is a wonderful rule. It's very sensitive to finding as you see here on the slide, systematic for an increase in random error. So yes, it's a good beginning. It's not the end of what we're going to talk about because, like I said, it, it doesn't differentiate systematic from increased random error. Now, we're not going to talk about troubleshooting today using the rules. We'll come back to that later. So what you have to do with the 1-3-S is decide whether it's random or systematic. And like I said, we won't go into that today. But like the slide says, it's difficult. Look down at the bottom. But it's difficult to troubleshoot without more information. So let's go on to the next slide. And here you see kind of the beginning. 
you look at the data, and in the original system, the question was, is there a value outside 2SD? If the answer is no, then you report the data. Now, that's exactly what Westard was saying 30 years ago, almost 40 years ago. And my position is that there's still many people who use that as a reject signal. That is cost ineffective, it's frustrating, and in a real sense, it doesn't work. Now, if you look at this slide, if the answer to the question is, yes, there's a value outside 2S, then we look to see if that 1, 3S that we just talked about is violated. If that answer is no, then we go to the next rule. Okay? And if you violate a rule, then you have to stop. Like the slide says, I, I got this from a seminar I did in Cleveland one time when I asked the people, I said, what do you want me to tell you in the next three hours? And one of the young ladies said, all I want you to tell me is when to free. Well, that's what the slide says. If you get two values outside, two SDs on the same side, either in the run, we'll look at this in a minute, or across runs, then what do you do? You stop and troubleshoot. You don't see anything there about rerunning controls. Why? Because the chances of getting two controls outside the same 2S or on consecutive days, something in the order of one out of 800 runs. So you go two and a half years before this would happen, just due to the inherent random error in the instrument. So when you get a stop signal, you need to start troubleshooting. And Zoe and I will be talking more about how to approach that later on. Let's go to the next slide. Here's an example of a 2-2-S rule within a run. See what Zoe has just done, she circled level O and level X. Now you'll notice that level O is outside negative 2. That was our warning. So what's the next best thing to do is look at the other level of control because in most instruments they were run right next to each other. If level X is outside the same 2S, then you've got a 2-2S within a run systematic error. Now systematic so can you come up there and highlight the letter S and systematic? No. Okay. Not that one? Okay. The, the first, that's fine. The first letter in the word systematic is what? S. S is the same letter that begins the word same. When you look at the Levy Jennings chart, you see where the two points are. They're on the same side. In other words, a 2-2-S rule means there's a systematic error. And like the slide says, it could be reagent, it could be calibration, it could be the instrument. We don't know yet, but we know it's a systematic error. So I think that the next best place to go would either be to the log that told us that you didn't recalibrate, let's say, or look in the documentation to see if you wrote something down that maybe you changed part of the instrument. There are other things that we can do, and we'll do that on another day. I'm kind of worried about time today. But the 2-2-S gives you some clues as to where to start looking. Now, there's another way you can break the same rule, 2-2-S, instead of within a run, you can do it across runs. If you take a look at the next slide, you'll see that. The next slide. Oops. See now, pay, this is important. Pay attention because you're going to want to argue with us. Maybe we should open up the mics in a second. You see on run 6, level X is outside 2S. Now, what did I tell you? That is a warning. That is not a stop and troubleshoot signal. Now that bothers some people 
because when you go to run 7, what you see there is the same level x outside the same 2s. So now we've got a 2-2s rule failure across runs. Run 6, like the slide says, it is accepted because that's a warning. But you don't stop and troubleshoot till you get run 7. Now, can we open up the mics and let them talk about that for a minute? Let me see for a second. That might actually be a little bit tricky. Um, okay. With this so, many people we'll on, I that. think we would get a lot of feedback. So I okay. think we'll try and hold questions till the end, and then I'll go sort of go around and open up one mic at a time. Okay. Okay. All right. Deal. Here's, here's basically what you're betting on when you see run six. Level O is in control. The chances of level X or level O being outside two S is 10% of the time. So out of every 10 runs that you have, an O or an X will be outside 2S and there'll be nothing wrong. So that's what you're betting on on run 6. If you did, and I'm not saying you should, I'm saying you should not, but if you did freak at run 6, you might find the problem. That's true. But 90% of the time, more than 90% of the time, when you get a value outside 2S, there's nothing wrong. And the question is, do you have resources to troubleshoot a non-entity? How many of you remember the story about the boy and the wolf? Well, that's what this is. More often than not, that X is there, or they always there, and it's crying wolf, and there's no wolf. Now, it does present a problem that the whole thing is not perfect. It, it is possible that there's a problem. And you don't accept that until run 7. So you do have to deal in that case with what the results went out on run 6. It is not, period, cost effective to freak on run 6, period. Not a rule failure. It's not a rule failure according to Westcard. It was not a rule failure according to the CAP, and you know that they make the rules. Um, it's never been. Actually, if you want to go all the way back to the middle 50s, when Levy and Jennings first drew the Levy Jennings chart, they did not set their limits to 2S then. Believe it or not, Levy and Jennings in the middle 50s set it at 2.8 S's. You want you can ask me why they did such a crazy thing later on, and I'll tell you. Let's go to the next slide and see what the flow chart says about this. Okay, so here we are. We've seen the beginning of this before. The first thing you do is look at the data. Is there no value outside 2S? Then you report the data. Beginning of this before. The first thing you do is look at the data. Is there no value outside 2S? Then you report the data. If there is a value outside 2S, then you can say, is it outside 3 or is it another one? If that answer is no, you go on, and that's where we are now. The answer to the 2-2S is no. So we go to another rule. The next rule, now I have to tell you this, the next rule that we're going to talk about is called the R, as it's random or range. The R4S rule is not a rule that uh, Jim Westgard really likes today. As I said, he was using an ACA. But let me show you a picture of the next slide where you do have a picture of the R4S. Now you know, based on your own SDs and CVs, they're not zero. So every instrument, the way I say it is, every instrument is packaged with a certain amount of random error in it. The pipettes are not perfect. The tubing isn't perfect. The line voltage coming in out of the wall is not always. 110.0 or 220.0. So there is random error. So the slide up at the top where it says R4S, you 
you see that it says an increase of random error and the increase of noise. See here what Zoe circled is the X is outside plus 2 and the O is outside minus 2. So the range between them is more than 4 SD. Again, the chances of that happening just due to the inherent random error is again less than 1 in 800. See all the rest of them, they're all okay. Something happens between 6 and 7 to make a lot of noise. Now, my position is you probably didn't do anything to make that happen. That would never happen if you recalibrated or changed reagents. So something is going crazy. Is that the line voltage is really, really fluctuating? Maybe a pump is not working consistently. Consistent is the word. Is the tubing beginning to flex at the wrong time? Something's going on. And then, of course, there's that age-old problem that you put control X and control O slot and vice versa and so that everything is cattywampus. In any case, this is a situation that requires some troubleshooting. I will tell you this now and we'll come back to it another time. You have a printout now, let's say on a chemistry analyzer that can run 25 different things, basically all at the same time. If you get an R4S rule like we have here in run 7, there's a very good chance that this is an instrument problem, a similar kind of situation that happened on a different test. Or even with ranges like that, you're going to see a lot of outliers on your patients. So before you pick up the phone and call the hotline or start rerunning controls again, be running the controls when you've got a rule failure is a total waste of time. The system already told you on run 7 there's something wrong. That something that's wrong is not going to get fixed by you rerunning the controls. It might sound like I'm on a podium speaking to the choir. I hope, I hope that's true. But what this says is you have to stop and troubleshoot it. Troubleshooting it's not rerunning the controls. Rerunning the controls is a way to verify that you fixed it. You don't need to rerun them to verify that there's a problem. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So we'll pick up our flow chart now, same as before. If the answers to those questions, nothing outside 3S, nothing outside 2-2S, no rule failure on the R4S, then where are we? When you've gone through the, the three rules that Westgard and I use today, that the 4-1-S that he talked about in 1981 was a mistake. The Panmean rule has always been a mistake. What difference does it make if you count back 10 days and say, well, gee, last week I was out of control. That, if the doctors haven't called you and chewed you out, then it wasn't a clinically significant problem. So, if the answer is not no, then the answer is yes, and you can see that you stop and troubleshoot, and like I said, we can come back to that later. It certainly does not say rerun the controls. Period. Next slide. I think that's the end. This is my favorite part. Oh, this is my favorite part, yes. Okay. What is the advantage of using these rules? Well, there are the three rules, 1-3-S, 2-2-S, and R-4-S. The chance of getting a 1-3-S flag when there's nothing wrong is 0.67%. It's 0.25 for a 2-2-S and 0.25 for a R-4-S. So if you add these together and round off to one decimal, it's 1.2%. Now, if you use, God forbid, the 1-2-S is a reject, like I said, you will get 10% false reject. 10% false reject. The difference is simply the system that we're talking about will cut out 
80% of the false rejects. What does that mean? Better turnaround time for the people in the emergency room. Better turnaround time for the patients on the floor. It's going to cost you less money in terms of controls, reagents, maintenance. And I'm not so sure that that last one isn't the most important one. You don't get as good, oh my God, I'm out of control again. We want the control, the control comes in. Yes, I told you that. 90% of the time, they're false rejects. So like Zoe just did for us, you're going to be happier. And I can't think of any nicer thing than to give the docs better turnaround time, help move the patients through, save money, 